everyone. My name is James. Welcome to King's Fine Woodworking. Today, we're going to build this unique shelf system. My wife was looking online for some pictures of shelving to hold some knickknacks or some more of her books. She came across something that looked like this, and I thought it would be something neat that we could put together with finger joints and show how to make a project with those. I had a lot of narrow and short cutoffs, uh, somewhere in the range of 10 to 15 inches, um, kind of warped, and uh, nothing very wide either. I didn't have much use for it, so I thought I could clean these up and turn these into that project. The first thing I do when starting any project, of course, is to joint one edge straight. Be sure to follow the instructions on your jointer as to the shortest piece that you can safely joint. It isn't safe to try to joint the edge of pieces that are too short. Once the first edge is jointed, you put that against the fence and you use the table saw to cut the other side parallel to the jointed edge. With all of our pieces ripped to the correct width, the next step is to cross cut them to length. What I do to start with is I cross cut them a little bit long and I'll come back later and cut them down to the perfect size. One reason to cut them a little bit long is because I have one more milling operation to do. I'm going to need to plane these down a little bit. One reason these boards have been sitting in my shop for a long time is because they were the off cuts of pieces that had a lot of warp and twist in them. I'm going to have to take that out for this project because I need these boards to be perfectly flat. It's actually not that hard to do and I'll show you how to do that. The first step is to take your boards over to the jointer. You're going to joint one side down and one face down until it's perfectly flat. It may take two or three passes to achieve this. Once that's done, and you can really tell if they're flat uh, by checking them against your outfeed on your jointer surface there because that piece of cast iron is perfectly flat. So once that's done, and it's checked, then I like to take a pencil and mark on the back side of it that this is the side that has not yet been flattened. And we'll just go in order and run all of our pieces through the jointer. Each of them will probably take different numbers of passes, but the key is to get everything down to the point where one side is perfectly flat. Then we will take these over to the planer and that pencil mark is going to need to go up because the planer is going to take the top portion of the board and cut it down so that it's parallel to the bottom portion and that's going to give us a board that is perfectly flat. And one of the reasons that we left our pieces a little bit longer than maybe necessary is in the event that you get any snipe at the end of your jointer or at the end of your planer we'll be able to cut those off in our last operation. And that's what we do next, is we take it back to the chop saw, or your miter saw, and we'll cut it down to the exact length at this point. Now all of your boards are going to be thinner than what you started with, and they're all, they're all going to come down to a thickness that's about equivalent to that of the thinnest board that you have. And that's not really a problem. The only thing that matters for a project like this is that they are all the same thickness. Whether they're 5 eighths or 9 sixteenths or, or anywhere in there, it doesn't really matter. The only thing that's important is that they're all the same. And so our shelf unit consists of four boxes of different sizes. And we have basically had 16 pieces to cut. And I've decided to use walnut and maple for contrasting colors for the box joints. I thought that might look nice. And so we're going to have eight walnut and eight maple uh, to make these four boxes. For the very next step, we are going to cut all of the joints on the finger joint jig or box joint jig that we just made. That was a video that I put out right before this one. And you can see all of our pieces are put together there. 
And if you would like to see how that's made, I'll put a link to that video in the description below. The box joint jig is a very simple single board attachment that we just rest or clamp to the top of our crosscut sled. To begin, we'll line the boards up the way we're going to cut them and we'll mark a pencil mark on one side. Now that side is always going to face the pin at the start of our finger joint cuts and that way we'll keep everything in perfect alignment. Keeping the board that we want to have cut tightly against the fence, we'll just proceed slowly through the dado cut until it cuts the first dado. Then we'll move the board over so that that dado slot fits nicely over the pin and make the second cut. And we'll just proceed all the way through the board like this, one cut at a time, until it's complete. So once the first board has been cut fully, we'll need to cut the second board, the board that will mate to this. It's going to be the mirror image or the negative of this board. So what we'll need to do is flip the first board around. Now the pencil mark once again is facing that. And we'll make the pencil mark for the second board there. Also face the pin. And we'll put these boards back to back with the maple board slightly over the pin. And that's how we get our perfect spacing for the first cut on the second board. And this is how we know these two boards will mate perfectly. Once that's done, we can remove the maple board, slide the walnut, walnut board over, and continue to cut. And then once again, we'll just proceed through the same series of cuts we did before, each time putting the board, or the data from the board, over the pin. So we'll just test the fit of this cut, and that looks pretty good. In the video where I build the box joint jig, I show you how to adjust the tightness or looseness of this fit to achieve the perfect fit. Once I have everything cut, I will move it over to my assembly table. I'll put all the joints together, make sure everything fits without any problem. Next, we have to prepare for the interlocking joints that will hold these together. I'm going to use a type of half lap joint to do that. So I'm going to have to push the cutting surface out away from the fence on my crosscut sled. So to do that, I'm building up some blocks of plywood here and screwing these things together. And you'll kind of see how that goes in just a minute. We also have to make sure that this block that we're creating is perfectly square. So to do that, I'm going to take it over my jointer and keep it against the fence while I joint the bottom side. If you're going to do this and you put it together with screws, you obviously will need to make sure that the screws aren't anywhere near the jointing surface. Finally, we should check it to make sure that it is in fact square. And now I'll set the depth for this half lap joint. Specifically, it's called an edge half lap or a cross edge half lap and you'll see how that goes but it's a pretty deep joint you can see from the height of the blade that I don't want that blade to get too close to my back fence because it would cut all the way through that's why I built the block to push it away from the back fence now I'm just going to try to get an idea of where exactly I want these joints to be cut I think this orientation looks pretty good and this is how they're going to go. Basically I'm going to cut halfway through uh, the top board and then halfway through the bottom board and then they will fit together interlocking. And I'm going to take a quick measurement here and decide if this looks good and I'll hold the other board over it to check.
getting exact measurements here isn't really necessary. This is really just a guide for me to see if I like the distance. If we decide that it looks good, then we'll set the exact measurement as a stop block on the sled. Okay, so these two boards from the big box have to be cut and they're going to be cut on that side. So I'm going to flip it upside down. That's the orientation that will go on the sled. And then these two boards are the opposing cuts that will fit in them. And I'm going to leave those face up because it's the bottom side of those that are going to be cut on the sled. Once I've done that, I'm going to make a little triangle mark on the top here. And that lets me know that this is the top. This is not the side that's going to be cut. And the opposing side, I'll just write bottom on. That's the side that I want my dado blade to cut through. I've carried it over to my crosscut sled in the right orientation. And I'm taking careful note of where my screws are in there so my dado blade doesn't pass through the screws. Dado blades are pretty expensive and we don't want to cut into screws with them. Next, I'll go ahead and clamp the stop block onto my fence in the right location. And remember, this is basically just to push the cut out forward. And now we'll kind of line it up here to see where I wanted that cut to be. And then I'll set my stop block against that edge. We'll clamp the stop block in. And now every cut that we make will be in the exact same location on all of the boards. So I have my dado blade set to cut exactly halfway through this material. I think the piece of wood is four and a half inches tall and I've set the dado blade to cut up two and a quarter inches to get halfway through. So now you can see that for me to get to the maximum depth on that dado blade, I have to push all the way to or slightly past the halfway point on the blade. I have a 12 inch dado blade, but even if I had a 10 or an eight, the blade has to go quite a ways back into the material behind it in order for the cut to reach the halfway point, the highest point on the blade. That's why I had to have that stop block in order to push this cut more forward. Otherwise, I would be cutting through a significant portion of my fence on my crosscut sled. Now I will simply proceed through and cut all four sides of the two boxes that are going to be interlocked together. If you don't happen to have a crosscut sled, it's something that you should consider building. The crosscut sled that I have here, I've designed, I created a video for it, and I'll put a link to that in the description as well. This crosscut sled has interchangeable inserts so that I can cut dados, and then when I'm done cutting dados, I can put a different insert in and go back to just using a regular single kerf blade and still have a zero clearance system. All right, the first joint is done. I will now go quickly mark out the next joint. This is a much smaller box, so I thought the overlap here should be a, uh, proportionally smaller. So again, I'm just kind of eyeballing what I think looks good. And then when I get over to the sled itself, I will actually make a mark, put my stop block in, and that way they'll all be cut to the exact same distance. So once again, I'll take care to remember which surfaces get cut. On the bigger box, it's the top surface, so I have to flip it. And on the smaller box, it's the bottom surface. So it's already in the correct orientation. I'll just line it up with the big box. And I'll make my triangle mark, indicating that this is in fact the top. This is not the side, which will receive the dado cut. I have measured and located my stop block and clamped that down so we're ready to make the cuts.
If you are new to woodworking and you haven't done cuts quite like this in the past, then it's probably a good idea to clamp these down when you're passing them through the saw blade. This is a pretty tall dado cut and you want to make sure that that board is held very securely. Okay, at the conclusion of all the cuts, we will take them back over to the assembly table. We'll put everything together and we'll check how it fits. And I'm just going to hover these over in the right place to make sure I have done all of the cuts in the correct orientation. And it looks as if I have. For the next step, it's best to get all of the sanding, or at least most of the sanding, out of the way at this point. It's going to be pretty hard to get inside and sand some of those surfaces after the box is put together. And once we get all of the pieces sanded, we will do a dry fit and see what this thing looks like once it's all put together. Not too bad, it's an interesting look. We're going to take it apart now and then glue the whole thing together one piece at a time. If you have seen any of our videos in the past, you will know that I am a big fan of making sure to put glue on both sides of all surfaces. And just in case you were wondering, that right there is exactly the right amount of glue for this job. Barely any waste. I almost can't even see the squeeze out. The next most important thing is to make sure that you clamp all of your joints very securely. Once it's fully clamped up, it's really important to check square. This is a time that you can adjust the clamps if need be to make sure that your box is perfectly square. I gave the first box about an hour or two to set. I took the clamps off and then I'm going to proceed to the next box. I'm going to glue two sides of this together, fit it in place, and uh, just keep proceeding in that fashion.
With a project like this that has a lot of joints to glue up, you want to proceed in sections. You don't want to try to put glue on everything all at once because the glue is going to end up setting on you before you get your project together. Depending on the glue that you use, they have different open times, so just be aware of that and glue up in stages. Once I have it glued in place, I'll quickly wipe off some of the excess glue so that I can get all of the clamps on. It's important to clamp all of the edges, top and bottom, to make sure you have a really secure fit. You get a really good deal on small clamps like these DeWalt ones. I think I got these at Home Depot, a four pack for about $20. And that's really cheap and it's a really good clamp for small glue ups, especially when you need a lot of them. So we're just going to proceed and continue uh, adding more boxes to our main one here. I uh, want to make sure we get plenty of glue inside of this cross lap joint on both sides as well. And oh, once this thing is done, it actually makes for a tremendously strong project. I find it easier to just glue two sides of the uh, uh, box that's going to go on to the original one here and hammer those down into place and then add the other two sides after the first one is already in place. I actually made my joints fit fairly snugly. They slid together just fine without glue, but they were a snug fit, so with glue, they need a little bit more persuasion with the mallet. I think if I made another one of these in the future, I might make that joint just a tiny bit looser uh, to allow for the, the glue to fit in there a little bit easier. And here we're just adding the other two sides of this box. And excellent. It looks like we have used just enough glue there. Is it brown on the bottom? I think I forgot to catch it on camera, but I did check square uh, for each one of these as I was putting them together and clamping them. Once again, lots of clamps to hold this piece securely together. My $5 DeWalt clamps to the rescue. Uh, and these things are actually all steel. They're, they're not plastic. They're actually a pretty good quality clamp for that price. We're not actually sponsored by DeWalt uh, or anybody for that matter. I just like to let you guys know when I find a product that I think works well and the, the price is good. And there she is. It looks like we had just enough clamps to uh, hold this thing together. I think they look pretty proud of their work too. For the last clamp up of a project, or especially a big clamp up, I like to let the glue dry overnight while in the clamps, if that's possible. That way you kind of get the maximum strength out of the piece. And I would like to take a moment to thank all of our Patreon supporters and all of you out there who support our channel by purchasing things at Amazon through our links in the description. Uh, without all of you, we wouldn't be able to produce uh, all of the woodworking projects that we do. So from all of us, thank you very much.
Okay, so now we need to sand all of those surfaces uh, where we had the glue squeeze out especially. Uh, there's a small possibility that we went overboard on the glue. Uh, I'm not so sure, but some people tell me that's the case. So maybe there's a little bit more sanding to do here than uh, we originally planned. And sometimes we just create custom sanding blocks. Uh, these things you, will last for a really long time. We'll just mark them. That's a 150 grit paper on there, and that helps us get into small areas. And here, we all, inevitably, there's always some chip out or some little flaw in a project. We make a wood putty with, um, you know, very fine sawdust of whatever wood we're using mixed with glue. Uh, put that into the cracks, let that dry a little bit, and when we sand that off, it's almost impossible to notice them. One of my favorite sanders to use is the random orbital sander. This seems to remove a lot of material and give a good finish. But when we get inside a project or we get up next to an inside corner, you can't really use that. It's going to scratch the opposing corner or surface. So you have to use one of these corner sanders or some people call them cat and mouse sanders. Those will get right up next to an edge and they'll do a good job. Uh, these are Ryobi sanders and I know a lot of people don't necessarily like Ryobi but for 25 bucks they make a sander that you know lasts easily with heavy duty use for several years when we're finished with the sanding i like to wipe all the dust off for the dry cloth first and then i'll use a little bit of acetone and wipe over everything again that'll kind of help pull the extra dust out from in between the grain of the wood And finally, it's time to put on our finish. Uh, my preferred finish for a lot of projects like this is lacquer. Lacquer is a very friendly finish, very easy to use. Uh, if you make an error, it's very easy to sand and fix. I'm using Deft, D-E-F-T, semi-gloss lacquer here. I like this product a lot. Uh, they have a very, very high quality nozzle spray tip at the end. And if I'm just doing a small project, I prefer to get these cans and finish it that way. It usually takes a can or two, which is a lot easier than pulling out my big air sprayer and getting uh, the gun and compressor and everything set up to spray. I like to put two or three coats and I like to sand lightly with 600 grit wet dry paper between the coats and after the final coat oftentimes I'll go back and do a very light sanding with 2000 grit that gives me a glass smooth finish and then I wipe off that fine dust with a tack cloth which is what my daughter is doing here. Now I want to put on some devices so to allow me to hang this on my wall. This is called a sawtooth picture hanger and I'm just going to put some brads in it. I think I'm, I've got enough surface here to put about four or five of these on and they'll actually hold about 30 or 40 pounds a piece so that's actually a couple hundred pounds in total weight that this shelf could carry with these which is plenty. Uh, we're just going to put some knickknacks on it or maybe some books. We're really not sure what uh, just yet. It's important to pre-drill before driving any sort of nail into hardwood because you don't want the wood to split. I have chosen a drill bit which is just a tiny bit smaller in diameter than the brad nail I am using. And it looks like I was able to get five of these on in total, so that's going to hold plenty of weight for us.
It seems like the bulk of our books are in the basement, so I think that's where we're going to mount this. So it's pretty simple to mount something like this. We just have one person hold a level, and uh, my daughter Maya is holding the level. My daughter Sai is just going to draw a line underneath each of those sawtooth hangers exactly along the edge of the wood. And that line is going to be the line through which we're going to drive a nail. So if each nail goes directly into the line, that's going to put the, them all directly in line to hold one of the sawtooth hangers equally. And that should keep our shelf perfectly level. So Sai is going to drive them most of the way in. And then Maya is going to set the depth to about the thickness of a coin, which is just enough head sticking out for the sawtooth hanger to grab onto it. Uh, a couple of these nails did go through studs. The rest just went through the drywall, but I still think that's plenty of strength to support the shelf and the small things we're going to put on it. So I think we spent the next half an hour experimenting, or what my wife and daughters did anyway, as to what on earth they're going to put on this shelf. They started with their knickknacks and moved on to books and various other things. And it looks like the girls all liked it, so that means it was a good build. And that will wrap up the project. Thanks for watching.